Today's presentation will be given by Stefan Henning, Visiting Assistant Professor in Anthropology and Sociology at Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. Professor Henning graduated from the doctoral program in Anthropology and History at the University of Michigan, so this is part of our alumni lecture series. He took his current position at Northwestern University after three years as a postdoc fellow at the University of Oxford. Henning studies the intersection of religious ethics and political action in 20th century China with a view on Nietzsche's analysis of religious morals in Europe. He has conducted fieldwork with Muslim activists in Beijing, Lanzhou, and Ningxia. Today he will be speaking on History of Seoul, a Chinese writer, Nietzsche, and Tiananmen, 1989. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much for inviting me um, back here. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ina, for arranging all the logistics. And as you can recognize from my funny accent, I'm from Europe. And when I first came in the mid-90s to the University of Michigan, and it was the China Center that first welcomed me here and was the first uh, academic unit here at, I was at, at the University of Michigan. And uh, so I not only want to take this opportunity to thank the China Center for inviting me here now, but also for um, being so, so treating me so well when I was a student here when I first arrived here. My deepest gratitude to Ernie Young and um, <coughs> other professors who aren't, who aren't here now. Um, my talk introduces a red guard turned Muslim writer by the name of Zhang Tenzhi and his novel, History of the Soul. History of the Soul and my talk an, are an examination of life in an authoritarian state. They are about how authoritarian rule works on an emotional level, what it can do to a person, but also about challenging that rule. Zhang Tengzhi said in History of the Soul, quote, I wrote this book to save myself, end of quote. Accordingly, I read his book as the life-affirming effort of a former Red Guard to work through the intellectual and emotional burden of the Cultural Revolution in his present. I also read it as a veiled reaction to the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989. Writing about Tiananmen is a taboo in China, but Zhang wrote about a small Muslim group in imperial China in a way that alludes to the instance of state violence in 1989 on every page. Most importantly, I argue that his book is a call to action against an authoritarian state and the culture that supports it. I try to show how Zhang calls on his readers by what I term etization, that is the interpretation of reality in ethical terms. In Zhang's case, by importing categories, narrative plots, and practices from Islamic traditions into the China of the 19, 1990s. From a completely different perspective, I also understand the life and politics of Zhang Tengzhi as an example of what Muslims in China have to offer to the members of the secular majority who, like Zhang, were actively involved in the traumatic transformations that led from Mao's triumphant and promising founding of the People's Republic in 1949 to the apolitical escape from utopias, ideals, and meaning in the freewheeling market economy of the 90s. Zhang Tengzhi was born in September 1948, exactly a year before Mao Zedong proclaimed on Tiananmen Square the founding of the People's Republic of China. Zhang grew up in the communist capital where the Quran and Islamic ceremonies were not part of his upbringing. In 1966, at age 17, it was Zhang who coined the name Red Guard when he signed a big character poster for this play on campus. Zhang took a brush and red ink and drew a soldier on horseback on the poster, which earned Zhang's group instant recognition from the other students who accepted the name. He became Mao Zedong's loyal Red Guard and was there when Mao reviewed Red Guard formations on Tiananmen Square. Zhang participated in the violence when the student organization turned against each other. He described in retrospect, quote, I rushed after a member of the rival student group. When he was cornered with no way out and turned his face to me, I realized that he was a former good friend from my elementary school class. At this moment, my raised hand with a bicycle chain trembled. I beat him all the same. Never in my life will I forget his eyes that looked straight at me." End of quote. Zhang was sent for re-education to the Chinese province of Inner Mongolia, where he herded sheep and ponies on horseback, taught in an elementary school that he had built, and became fluent in Mongolian. After four years on the grasslands among rural Chinese, Zhang returned to Beijing in 1972, where he received a degree in archaeology from Beijing University and a master's in ethnology. Upon graduation in 1981, now age 33, he was employed as an ethnologist by the Academy of Social Sciences. Throughout the 1980s, Zhang established himself not only as a scholar, but also as one of China's foremost fiction writers with two novellas, a novel, and countless short stories. <coughs> 
He was inducted into the steering committee of the Chinese Writers Association, and his novels are taught in Chinese college textbooks. One novella was translated into English, French, and Italian. When the Cultural Revolution ended in disaster and Mao died in 1976, he was haunted by the challenge to comprehend how the moral promise of the revolution had come to naught and how to understand his own participation in the violence. He began to read Nietzsche, took up painting, became interested in Christianity, and visited Japan, Europe, and the United States. He left Beijing as often as possible under the pretext of doing research to field research to Rome, China, Central Asian province, and Inner Mongolia, trying to lose himself in the landscape and among poor farmers and nomads. In December of 1984, Zhang stayed in the house of an impoverished fa Muslim farmer who showed Zhang a scholarly article by a Chinese Muslim historian about the history of a group of Chinese Muslims who practiced Sufism, a mystical form of Islam. Zhang learned that the history of that group was a long series of confrontations with the last dynasty, which the Sufis interpreted as seeking martyrdom. At the same time, a throng of Sufis sought out Zhang day after day in the house of his host to tell Zhang's stories from that Sufi group's oral history. Zhang was shaken by the sudden encounter with a religious group that insisted on living its collective life according to its own abstract ideals, even at the risk of persecution, and decided to write about the Sufi group. Drawing on his academic training as an archaeologist and ethnologist, Zhang researched the history of the Sufis. He discovered that the group had a tradition of writing secret handwritten histories in Persian, Arabic, and Mandarin, texts that were copied by hand and transmitted through the generations. The Sufis gave him access to these texts, and Zhang cooperated with mosque students to translate them into Chinese. Zhang also traveled to Sufi groups that were dispersed all over China, participated in prior prayer recitation and pilgrimages to the tombs of Sufi leaders, and recorded oral histories. After four years of research, Zhang began to write in the summer of 1989, just after the Tiananmen incident, the manuscript for History of the Soul, a genre transcending text at once history, biography, and religious parable. He completed the manuscript in the summer of 1990 and left the country for Japan. It was a realistic decision because soon after History of the Soul appeared in 1991, the government banned the book for about two years. On the surface, History of the Soul is about a group of Chinese Muslims who practice Sufism. The Sufi group was founded in the mid-18th century in China by a Chinese who had gone from northwestern China to Yemen, apprenticed himself to a Sufi leader there, and returned to China with new meditation techniques, ceremonies, and texts. <coughs> the Sufi group is in, in China called the Jahrenye. The founder of the group became its first leader. He was succeeded by a long chain of leaders throughout the generations, and History of the Soul describes the lives of the first seven generations of leaders up to 1920, when the seventh leader died. I refer to the leaders as Moshid, the technical term of that leadership position. The Jahrenye founder converted many followers from other Sufi groups. The other pre-existing groups felt threatened by his success and managed to embroil the Chinese state into a conflict with the Jahrenye. The conflict turned violent and escalated into a regional war in the Northwest. It ended in the 1780s when the imperial military executed the founder on the walls of Lanzhou, northwestern China's largest city, before the eyes of his followers who had laid siege to the city. The surviving Jahrenye interpreted the violent death of their Moshid as martyrdom and henceforth expected that they themselves, as well as their Moshid, would die as martyrs in the battle with the last dynasty. Zhang described in History of the Soul how the Jahrenye survivors retreated after the execution of the first leader to a hill fortress in the northwest that was surrounded by the imperial troops in 1784. Using official dynastic histories from that period, Zhang set out to write an account of the siege that, not surprisingly, ended with the imperial army storming the fortress, killing the men, castrating boys over the age of 11, and exiling women and children to the frontiers. But Zhang was thrown off by an odd detail in the oral histories of today's Jahrenye, which he compiled in the late 1980s. Jahrenye members he interviewed claimed that the defenders of the fortress were killed right on the day that marks the breaking of the fast at the end of Ramadan. Martyrdom on that day would incur enormous merit for the afterlife, and Zhang scoffed at the at the forced coincidence. As a trained archaeologist and ethnologist, he consulted several historical calendars to ascertain the exact date of the fall of the fortress and the end of Ramadan that year. He matched the Chinese lunar, the Islamic, and the Gregorian calendars and found that the fortress indeed fell the day after the end of Ramadan. <coughs> 
Confused and alarmed, Zhang searched for further source texts and located the account of a low-ranking official in charge of grain supplies in the area and at the time of the Johannia War. The personal account of the official had escaped the censorship of imperial record keepers and stated how rival Muslim militias had educated the imperial commander about the significance of Ramadan, suggesting that the commander should chose, choose the break of the fast to mount his final attack when the Johannia would be engaged in prayer. Zhang read the official military account again and identified one sentence that, quote, had escaped the self-censorship, unquote, of the official dynastic historians, quote. On the third day of the lunar calendar, one could sense panicked chaos from the camp of the outlaws. At that time, one could hear the voices of women and girls shouting and crying, end of quote. Zhang concluded that there is only one way to make sense of this sentence. At the day when the fast should be broken, the highest surviving imam in the hill fortress announced his decision to postpone breaking the fast to wait for the enemy's attack. At that moment, the defenders cried out because the decision meant that they would not leave the fortress alive. They forfeited the slight chance at escape in this desperate defense to realize the ideal of martyrdom during the prayers that end Ramadan. Zhang's textual research revealed the official version by the last dynasty to be a lie. The scholar literati commissioned by the throne to write the official account of the campaign had to represent a massacre as a fierce last stand. They could not acknowledge that the Sufis undercut the function of state violence and the logic of authoritarian rule by laying down their weapons to realize an abstract ideal, martyrdom, rather than resist violence with violence. But why did these state commissioned historians have to lie? What was so threatening about the truth? Zhang explained, quote, there was no counterattack in defense, there was only massacre. Before this sense of self-discipline that resembled a knife's blade, Emperor Tianlong and the literati he employed were terrified. Encountering a humanity of that kind, a government based on violence was suddenly afraid. They attempted a cover-up. They did not dare to cross a great borderline about which they themselves were not clear. Therefore, a concise record of the pacification of Stone Peak Fortress transmitted a forgery through the time until I and the Moss student Wan, Yang Wan Bao penetrated and exposed it. Texts like a concise record are a shame among books. Emperor Tianlong, who called himself Lord over World of Abundance, discovered that an opponent was hiding in some place in the Northwest. He felt this opponent was strange. He was incapable of dispelling this black shadow in the Northwest. He sensed it was an organization. The investigation commenced under Emperor Tianlong's personal supervision." End of quote. This quote bears an eerie resemblance to a passage in Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, quote from Nietzsche. So far, the most powerful humans have bowed to the saint in veneration as a riddle of self-conquest. They sensed in him the superior force that wanted to test itself in such a conquest, the strength of the will. In addition, the sight of the saint aroused a suspicion in them. Such a monstrosity of negation of anti-nature won't be desired for nothing. The powerful of the world learned from him a new fear. They sensed a new power, an alien as yet unvanquished enemy. It was the will to power that made them stop in front of the saint. They had to ask him." End of quote. The ascetic's will to dominate was not directed out into the world like the ruler's, but into his own wishes, fears, yearnings, and dreads, in short, toward his personality. The ascetic voluntarily subjected his body to torture, an absurd act in the eyes of the ruler who tortured others so too as to rule the world. The ascetic forced himself to face his worst fears and deprive himself of his deepest wishes. Subjecting his personality and body to a regimen of discipline, the ascetic strengthened his will to rule over his body, his feelings, and through the absurdity of voluntary self-torture, even his reason. Uh, through this self-mastery, the ascetic became immune to the worldly hegemon's will to rule. His worldly rule worked with an incentive and a threat. The incentive was the safety and sensual pleasure in an empire of abundance that numbed the self-awareness of a life directed by another's will. The threat was persecution, punishment, and execution at the hands of the ruler's henchmen, whose military might could not be challenged. The ascetic, whose will had mastered his body, his feelings, and his reason, could not be attracted by the incentive, nor be cowed by the threat. Nietzsche's ascetic and Zhang's Sufis trained themselves by disciplining their emotions. The ascetic did this through bodily techniques, and the Sufis by placing their collective politics on an abstract ideal, martyrdom, that assigned a role to the authoritarian state which the state authorities played out unwittingly. Both jammed the logic of worldly rule. The parallel between Nietzsche and Zhang also extends to the rulers. 
In Nietzsche's scenario, the ruler felt toward the ascetic simultaneously fear and curiosity, just like in Zhang's passage, Emperor Tianlong, the most powerful of all Chinese rulers before Mao, was suddenly afraid and felt his opponent was strange. Nietzsche's ruler and Zhang's emperor approach the ascetic and the Sufis because they sense a new, different form of power. I suggest that this way of relating feelings, ethics, and power was first made explicit by Nietzsche. I further suggest that this approach eventually traveled to China in introductions and translations, where it was appropriated since the early 20th century by scores of Chinese writers, philosophers, and revolutionaries, among them Mao Zedong. Nietzsche could, of course, not imagine the very different political context of a totalitarian and an authoritarian state. But his combination of ethics and power lent itself to a politicized interpretation of life in an authoritarian state. It can relate the ethical indictment of authoritarian rule to a politics in the name of abstract ideals, which is resistance. In my view, this was the way History of the Soul was read when it came out two years after Tiananmen. And this was the reason, I believe, why the government banned the book. Next example from History of the Soul is from the mid-19th century. At the time, the fifth Murshid, Ma Hualong, decided to shelter defeated Muslim refugees from central China in his fortress in northwestern China, even though the refugees were not Sufis. This decision brought the war with the dynasty to the Jeharemir. In 1870, after three years of holding out against the imperial army, as the defenders of smaller Jeharemir strongholds began to starve, and the break of the siege around his own fortress became illusory, the Murshid Ma Hualong asked one of his imams about the sacrifice at Koban. At Koban, which itself means sacrifice, Muslims slaughter and consume sheep. Zhang quoted the dialogue between Ma Hualong and his imam from a secret handwritten Jaharania history from the 19th century. Quote, the Murshid asked, what is the most precious thing that can be sacrificed at Koban? The imam answered, a camel. After that comes a cow, then a sheep. The Murshid said, your Koban is only these types of livestock. Even you and Imam do not know the most precious sacrifice. The most precious is Abraham, who was willing to sacrifice his son Ishmael. To save the masses, I have made up my mind to sacrifice myself." End of quote. Mahvalung walked out the gate of his fortress and into the encampment of the commander of the imperial army. The commander's uncle had been killed during the siege by Jahar and fighters. To surrender himself to the imperial commander meant for Ma Hualong to submit himself to his personal revenge for the death of his uncle. Accordingly, Ma Hualong was not merely executed for his violent resistance to the state, but slowly tortured to death. He died on his 56th day in the enemy camp. After Ma Hualong's surrender, the imperial commander searched out the survivors of Ma Hualong's lineage and executed all the 302 members he could identify. Yet Ma Hualong's surrender did stop the fighting. His group survived. Zhang commented in History of the Soul on Ma Hualong's enactment of Abraham's story, quote, it was a small event in the history of China, but in the history of faith, of religion, of the soul, and of sacredness, it was a rarely seen outstanding event, especially in China, where the morality and ethics of the Confucian order replaced religious faith. The realization of the ancient theme of Abraham signaled the degree of the pursuit of the soul among Chinese. Even more so, it explained the difficulty of religion to exist in Chinese society." End of quote. Zhang suggests here that Confucian ethics and Islamic faith are two different ways of approaching existence and of arranging collective life. He Im implies that the Sufi Muslims pursued the soul and Chinese living Confucian ethics did not. Rather than to pass, like Zhang, blanket statements about huge cultural and religious formations, statements that are so general they approach stereotyping, I would like to stress the specificity of the story of Abraham's piety as a concrete example of what I call ethical resources. The story is a tool in the ethical repertoire of Chinese-speaking Muslims to interpret a political situation on an existential level. It made for Ma Hualong the self-rectifies um, imaginable and hence doable. Since the story of Abraham is part of Islamic traditions but not of Confucian or Taoist ones, this specific interpretation, consequently the path of action to cope with the violence of an authoritarian state, was open to Ma Hualong, a Chinese Sufi Muslim, but would not be available to non-Muslim and non-Christian Chinese. When Zhang conducted his field work among the Jahrhenya Sufis, he participated in the ceremonies, including prayer. Every morning after the first prayer that begins just before dawn, Jaharenya Sufis recite after the standard prayer the Islamic proclamation of faith, quote, among the myriad beings, there is no Lord, there is only God, end of quote. 
They sit in two rows facing each other and sway their heads in the rhythm of the recitation. They recite the proclamation 56 times, one for each day that Ma Hua Lung had been tortured in captivity 140 years earlier. The repeated recitation is exclusive to the Jehoranye who call it Aulate. Zhang joined the mo morning prayer and performed Aulate during his fieldwork among the Jehoranye. This is his representation of experiencing Aulate. Quote, no historical sources recorded those 56 days of torture. No historian has truly explored the mind of the dying person. And yet, in the darkness before dawn, in locations spread out over half of China, people are counting the 56 seconds of this history. In the rectangle formed by the praying people wearing white caps, everyone recognizes repeatedly a minimum truth. As I was reciting along with the crowd, I could not explain the feelings of being moved that flooded my heart. In this way, every illiterate farmer in remote, poor villages could accurately grasp one point in history." End of quote. It is my thesis that history of the soul is not only about a Sufi group in imperial China, but also about the Cultural Revolution and about June 4th, 1989. I cannot help but read Zhang's representation of our latter that keeps the memory of Ma Hualong's death alive as an expression of Zhang's anxiety over the future of the collective memory of Tiananmen. Ji Wei remarked already in 1984 in Dialectic of the Chinese Revolution from Utopianism to Hedonism just how soon urban Chinese have managed to forget Deng Xiaoping's use of the People's Liberation Army against unarmed protesters. Forgetting Tiananmen was a precondition for urban Chinese to commit themselves to the freewheeling market economy that took off in China after 1992. Thanks to forgetting Tiananmen, commodification and consumption have replaced serious political commitment. In an ethical sense, forgetting is a form of forgiving. By forgiving the Communist Party the massacre, the authoritarian state survived its most recent and most serious crisis. I think Zhang had a premonition of this capacity to forget when he wrote about Awa Lata in 1990. When History of the Soul was first published in 1991, it held the emotional and ethical presence of the past among a small Sufi group up to the urban readers to make them conscious of their collective amnesia about 1989. The mnemonic practice of Awalata is part of Islamic traditions and therefore, again, not available to the overwhelming majority of Chinese. Keeping the emotional outrage at state violence alive, it contrasts starkly with the swift forgetting among urban Chinese. It is another in indication of how well the ethical condition of the majority harmonizes with an authoritarian political form. This brings us to the 1990s. Zhang returned to China in 1992 from Japan and then Canada, where he had considered immigrating to. The ban against history of the soul was lifted the following year, but Zhang has been under surveillance from his Chinese secret service ever since. Back in China, Zhang wrote no more fiction but published scores of essays. Collections of his essays were published in rapid succession, titled uh, Spirit of Purity and The Hero's Barren Road appeared in 1993, Thinking That Stands Alone in 1995, and with the writing brush as my banner in 1999. Zhang's collected works were published in 1995 in four volumes, and another edition of his collected works appeared in 1999 in five volumes. Zhang become, became one of the most important public intellectuals in China after Tiananmen. His texts were debated not only in specialized literary journals, but also in China's most prominent politicized intellectual magazines like Du Shu, Wen Huibao, and Tianya. But the China he returned to in 1993 was not the China he had left in 1990. Deng Xiaoping had initiated in 1992 China's total transformation to a market economy. Urban Chinese followed Deng's call and threw themselves head over heels into commercialization and consumption. This transformation radically depoliticized the urban public. It is crucial to see that while the 1980s and in fact the entire history of the People's Republic before Tiananmen were a politics to shape life and society according to abstract categories, it was impossible after Tiananmen to mobilize the public by an appeal to ideals, the noble and the sublime, as urban Chinese did their best to live on life on the level of the body and its sensual enjoyment. When Mao initiated the Cultural Revolution, he held out, held out the enormous promise that Chinese will realize the ethical ideal of an egalitarian society free of hierarchies. This promise was the exact opposite of life before 1949, when the overwhelming majority lived in poverty and under the subjugation of authoritarian rule. The revolution promised a life in material plenitude as well as in dignity. 
The promise instilled enormous hope and enthusiasm that gave the effective strength to fulfill the concrete demands of the revolution, which required sacrifices in physical comfort and in education, but also demanded to exert physical violence on the enemies of the revolution, including the willingness to torture and to kill. I suggest that with the failure of the Cultural Revolution, the death of Mao in 1976, and finally with Tiananmen 1989, which annihilated yet another quest for an ethical ideal, this time of the rule of law, a rationally ordered society, and justice, a whole way of thinking, of feeling, and of doing politics shipwrecked. The politics of ideals had become absurd, not only intellectually, but also emotionally. After the twin disasters of the revolution in Tiananmen, an ethical ideal which demands awe as something noble and sublime, and which as something abstract cannot be seen or touched but calls on imagination and fantasy, could not inspire anymore the enthusiasm and hope needed for its realization. The urban public had lost its ability to generate another utopia, to commit itself to yet another ideal, and even to create meaning altogether. But Tiananmen had also been the most recent and most serious challenge to the rule of the Communist Party and the authoritarian state. Until Tiananmen, the authoritarianism and the party's monopoly on political power could be viewed as necessary to lead society into a better future. But with the massacre, the bond between the state and party on the one side and the people on the other dissolved. Suddenly, the continuity from the autocratic empire to the authoritarian People's Republic, both of whom ruled with violence, came into view. The party and the state had become opponents of the people and were suspected to be the cause for China's problems rather than their solution. In this situation, the memory of Tiananmen continues to have the potential to pose a challenge to the party and authoritarian rule. Yet the realization of this potential would depend on an ethical interpretation of the incident. Because in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution in Tiananmen, any appeal to ideals and with it ethization had become absurd, the challenging potential of Tiananmen was neutralized. I argue that here lies the significance of Zhang's history of the soul. Firstly, Tiananmen has been a taboo topic. Zhang broke the taboo when he managed to write about Jahrenia Sufis in a way that any reader could see that he was actually writing about Tiananmen and that in the public, in print, for anyone to see. This alone was a feat of dissimulation in writing that took enormous creativity as well as courage. Secondly, Zhang introduced concrete techniques to train the self to cope with fear, which is a precondition for political activism in an authoritarian state. Thirdly, history of the soul articulated a vision of life, community, and doing politics that evoked enthusiasm about life. Against the background of this vision, life in the authoritarian state appeared mistaken, inhumane, and illegitimate. Zhang's affirmation of life as exciting and precious gave the reader something in the name of which and for the sake of which they could become active in an environment of commercialization and consumption. It is in this sense that history of the soul is dangerous to the state. It is also the reason I suggest that Zhang left the country right before publication, that the state banned the book, that Zhang is under surveillance, and that Zhang has been a hotly debated writer in the China of the 1990s. Whether more than debate will come from it remains to be seen. Thank you.